right, so I'd like to start this morning with a quick activity, and I'm going to need your help. So please don't leave me standing up here asking you questions with no answers, okay? So the first one is, um, is pretty easy. We're going to say that these three rectangles represent uh, groups of people, and the X's are people who are outside the group, and then the X's inside are the people who are inside the group. And these boundary markers represent qualities of the people who are in the group, okay? It's gonna get clearer as we go along. So let's say this first group represents US citizens. So this represents US citizens. What are the outward, maybe superficial kinds of qualities that you see in people that tell you that, that this person is a US citizen, especially if they're out abroad or something like that? What do you guys think? What do you think of when you think US citizen? Wow. What? Loud, that's absolutely true. I was looking up, um, I was looking up the 13 ways for people to tell that you're an American citizen when you're abroad, and that was number one, is that US people are apparently really loud, smile a lot, laugh a lot, just really loud. Okay, what else? What else? Generous. Generous, that's right. So that was also on the list of the top um, 13 things. Apparently, Americans leave tips, really big tips, even places where there shouldn't be tips or it's not necessary. Waiters and waitresses will chase you down to try to give your money back, but that's very an American thing. What else? What is it? Friendly. friendly. Yes, they also say that. Um, friendly. That... Americans will come up to people and start talking to them, smile at people that they don't know, which isn't something that people in other countries necessarily do. What else? Maybe one or two things more. This morning, someone said fanny packs. <laughs> so you know it's an American if they're wearing a fanny pack. What else? Let's see if we can get one more thing. Clothes style. So this can go one of two ways. The article that I was reading said, you know they're an American if it's a grown man that's dressed like a little kid. And by that, <laughs> by that they mean a baseball cap turned backwards, which is apparently something only kids do in other countries. Um, or I was reading um, an article written by a French woman, and she was saying that when you see girls with really, really pressed hair and really, really tall boots trying really hard to look French, and that's usually a sign of an American too. So we have these qualities, right, that we look around, kind of superficial, but we can kind of distinguish maybe someone is part of this group. Now let's say this one is Christianity. Did I spell that right? Anyways, you know how to spell it. So how would you distinguish if someone is a Christian or not a Christian? What are the boundary markers that tell you someone belongs to this group? Loving. Okay, that's one that we got this morning, too. What else? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be spiritual qualities. It can be superficial. You can say the Jesus fish on the back of the car. That's okay, too. What, what else do you think of when you think Christian? That person you look, and that person's a Christian. Yeah, WWJD. So maybe um, the bracelets or the paraphernalia. Not as popular now, but people still do it. Let's get one or two more things about how you can tell someone is a Christian. Yeah, conservative. conservative. Which is funny because no one ever considers themselves conservative, right? Um, everyone considers themselves in the middle of the spectrum. Other people are conservative or liberal, but we're just in the middle. Let's see if we can get one more thing. Praying in public before eating, yes. How about if we added another layer? What about Adventists? How would somebody know that someone else is an Adventist? Hey, sex. Hey, sex. You know, I was waiting for that one this morning, but no one said it. And that's like the number one one, right, that we always talk about. What else? See if we can get a couple more. Veggie meat? What did, I heard one up there. Clothes? Clothing. What do you mean by clothing? What was that? How someone is dressed. Okay, someone told me after first service this morning, like, yeah, really long skirts, kind of an Ellen White style, that that kind of makes. So anything that's uh, EGW, so we'll go with EGW, and we said veggie meat, right? Okay, so these are the ways that we can identify kind of in a superficial way that someone is a Christian. Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question, but I want you to think. What if I said that this group or this category represented people who were going to go to heaven? What qualities would you add? 
What qualities would you subtract? It seems at first an easy question. But the truth is I never really thought that much about this kind of thought, this boundary marker kind of Christianity about what makes me in and what makes me out until the summer of 2009. I was 17 years old. I had just graduated from high school. And I joined a program called Youth Rush, which is uh, literature evangelism. Have any of you ever heard of literature evangelism? Okay, it's something more of maybe our parents' generation. But what it essentially is, is you join a program, you live in a church, girls live in one Sabbath school room, and boys live in another Sabbath school room, and you take showers at the local gym, not together, of course, you ride in separate vans, and you go door to door um, selling Ellen White books and having an opportunity to pray with people and see if they want Bible studies. And I need to preface all of this by saying I have nothing against literature evangelism or Ellen White books. This is not what this is about. But I had a challenging experience that summer because I realized that my literature evangelism leaders had a really strong and rigid sense of what it meant to be in, not just in Adventism or in the kingdom, but in heaven and what it meant to be out. And I had grown up believing that I had been saved by grace through faith alone. And so I had never really worried that much about whether or not I was gonna go to heaven. Until a few weeks into the 10 week program, one of my literature evangelism leaders decided to come with me door to door. And for two hours, he asked me tons of questions. He said, how do you know that you're gonna go to heaven? And you know, I said, well, by grace through faith, I've been baptized, I believe in Jesus. And he's like, no, I've noticed that, you know, you're not vegan. I've noticed, and he started to point out all of these different things that we would never consider a testing, a test of whether or not we follow Jesus. At least I hadn't considered that growing up. But he started to point out all these things, and not just that, but he married them with scripture. He started to say, you know, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And he started to read all of these different things about people, you know, who don't go to heaven and gnashing of teeth and all these things. And I don't know if it's because I had already been in the program for a couple months, but I remember at that time I was trying to tell him, no, you know, God doesn't make it so hard for us to be saved. He does it through Jesus. I was saying everything I had been taught. But I remember a dark cloud kind of just came over me. I remember my heart just felt gripped by fear. I remember thinking, what if I'm wrong? What if the stuff I was taught is wrong? And everything they're saying about, I should only eat two meals a day because that's what Ellen White said that we need to do. And these things are wrong. And if you show your clavicle, which I learned what a clavicle was because we weren't allowed to wear anything below this. If you show your clavicle, you're not gonna go to heaven. I had, I had heard these things and laughed at them before, but after all of these conversations, I, I thought, what if I'm wrong? And How horrible would it to be wrong? And then like, I'm not gonna go to heaven, and what does that say about God? And I started to experience all of this fear. And so I remember I texted my mom, and I told her, you know, I'm I'm concerned about my salvation. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of God. Maybe I don't know who he is. Maybe I haven't read the Bible enough. And she texted me all night, different verses from scripture, and I spent literally all night. I didn't go to sleep. I sat outside my Sabbath school room. And I didn't go to sleep. And I was paging through scripture, but it seemed like nothing that I could find was really speaking to my heart. Until she sent me Galatians 3, verses 1 through 5. We're in Galatians 3 this week here at One Place. And this is what it said. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? Now, I didn't understand all the theological truths in this, but it was like in that moment, God God shot an arrow of light straight into my heart, and I heard him speak to my heart and say that it was never gonna be my salvation, it was never gonna be by anything that I did. And that if I thought I could start being saved by believing in Jesus in faith, and then I was gonna continue the rest of my spiritual journey through works of the law, through efforts, through trying to earn God's salvation, then I was a fool, just like the Galatians. And that's essentially what Paul is saying to the Galatians here. 
A little backstory. Paul had done a big evangelistic campaign through Galatia, and it had been successful. He had started churches, and people had given their lives to God. But there were three main players in this story. There were the Jews, who, as you know, are the people of Israel, the children of God, who were still waiting for a Savior, even though Jesus had come. There were Christians, which included Jews who had given their lives to Jesus, and Gentiles, non-Jews, who had turned to Christ. And then there was a group in the middle, the one that Paul is so upset with, called the Judaizers. And who they are is a group of people who were formerly Jews, but then became Christians, but wanted to bring their Jewishness into Christianity. And they had boundary markers. So if this is them, they had boundary markers for how you know that you're saved. And these are the three boundary markers. Circumcision, you have to be circumcised to be part of God's family if you're a male. Dietary restrictions, which is why last week Donnie talked about, you know, different places you can eat and different places you can't. They said it's Jesus plus circumcision plus dietary restrictions plus observing sacred days and festivals. That's how you got inside. And the reason it was so, so important to be inside is something that Paul brings up in the next verses in Galatians. He, he talks about Abraham and about who is truly Abraham's children. And the reason that's important, and I, I was confused about this when I first read it. The reason that's important is because even though we grew up singing, Father Abraham has many sons. Many, okay, so when I grew up singing that song, I didn't understand what it meant. I remember asking my parents, why Abraham? Why is he our father? I'm not a son, I'm a daughter, all these things. But the reason it's important is because back in Genesis 12, God chose Abraham to be the spiritual and physical father of Israel who were gonna be his people. And one of the first signs that he gave to Abraham of belonging to God was that males were gonna be circumcised. That's their sign of belonging to God's people. And so what they so badly wanted in order to belong to God's people was to be part of the family. And so when Jesus, when Jesus challenged these things, when Jesus challenged circumcision, dietary laws, and the Sabbath, John Ortberg in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, he says Jesus was not just disagreeing with them on how to interpret the law. He was threatening their very understanding of themselves as the people of God. He wasn't just saying, oh, you should do this or you shouldn't do this. He's saying, no, that's not how you know you're God's people. John Ortberg, again, in the book, The Life You've Always Wanted, gives a definition of boundary markers. He says that boundary markers, these things are the highly visible, relatively superficial practices that allowed people to distinguish who was inside and who was outside the family of God. The issue here is that it's all about position. Where do you stand? Do you fit the criteria? Are you in or are you out? And yet Jesus had a completely, completely different way of gauging people's spirituality. In Jesus' world, there are no boxes. There is no, are you in or are you out? Boundary lines are artificial. They're created by humans for power, for wealth, for social structure. In Jesus' world, in the gospel that he taught, there are no boxes, there's just a center. And he's the center. And the center of spirituality is not, do I meet these benchmarks for following God? The center for spirituality is, do I love God and do I love people? In my relationship with God, it's not positional. Where am I on the board? It's directional. In what direction am I heading? Am I heading closer to the center or am I heading further away from it? This is why Jesus could look at religious leaders who kept all the laws and say, you're outside the kingdom of heaven because your life and your love for God and love for people are heading away from me. And he could look at people who were prostitutes and tax collectors who seemed like the furthest thing from God's kingdom and say, you're in because your life has been redirected toward me, toward my love, toward love for God, toward love for people. And that's what Paul is addressing to the Galatians. They somehow had been deceived by the Judaizers and they thought that they needed to have circumcision and they needed to have dietary practices and all these things on top of what God had already done for them. Harry Truman once said, if you can't convince them, confuse them. And I firmly believe this is the strategy that the enemy has used in our lives. If he can't convince us not to believe in the Bible, he can confuse us. And the way he confuses us is by saying, it's more than Jesus. You need more than Jesus. Jesus and, instead of Jesus, period. 
He says things like, you need to believe in Jesus, but then after that, you have to go to church, and you have to do devotions, and you have to give tithe, and you have to do all of these things. And don't get me wrong, when Jesus is our center, there are going to be beliefs and habits and practices that we have in our life that is different from the people around us. But the difference is when Jesus is our center and we're living our lives because of love for God and love for people, instead of it being this forced thing that we have to do, instead of wondering whether or not we're going to be saved if we do these things, or even feeling like we can somehow earn God's smile at us, we can somehow earn his favor, we do it just out of the, what Eugene Peterson calls the unforced rhythms of love. And so John Ortberg gives us some, some evaluative questions to decide whether or not we're boundary line Christians or we're Jesus-centered Christians. This is what he says. The first question is, am I spiritually authentic? Am I preoccupied with appearing to be spiritual more than I'm preoccupied with my inward spirituality? Because boundary line Christianity is positional. So as long as you look like you're in the right place, it's okay. So if we have that, if we care more about how we appear spiritually, doing impression management and trying to make ourselves look good, we might be boundary line Christians. Am I becoming more judgmental, exclusive, or proud? We'd never say that. We'd never say, oh, I'm judgmental, exclusive, and proud. <laughs> but the way that we would know that is, am I comparing myself with others? Because that's where judgment Exclu exclusivity and pride come from, is comparison. A third question, am I becoming more approachable or less? Am I growing weary of pursuing spiritual growth? Stephen Mosley says, tragically, conventional religious goodness manages to be both intimidating and unchallenging at the same time. It's intimidating because it can involve 39 separate rules about Sabbath keeping, but it is ultimately unchallenging because we can devote our lives to observing all the rules and yet never open our heart to love or joy. Am I measuring my life in superficial ways? Is it about the length of my prayers and how many quiet times that I've done? Or is it really about how I'm treating people, if I'm becoming a more patient person, if it's more difficult for the enemy to get me discouraged? These are some of the measures of true spiritual life, but the way that we sometimes choose to settle is by the outward things. And the reason for that is because the boundaries make us feel safe. I mean, think about a life with no boundaries. Think about this life, where your life is either oriented towards Jesus or not. If there's no tried and true official way that you can say, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I don't have to be afraid. The boundaries keep us safe, but they also keep people out and ultimately keep Jesus out. Because the truth is, you can't have grace and earning at the same time. Grace is diametrically opposed to earning. You cannot both work for something and deserve it and then receive it as a free gift from God. That's what the Judaizers were teaching, and that's what sometimes we come into believing. We come to believe what our world tells us in a hundred different ways all the time, that our identity, our value, is tied up in what we do and what we accomplish, what we look like, who we are. We come to believe that in order to be part of the club, we need to do things a certain way. And meanwhile, Jesus says, no, I came, I died, so you could have everything, so you could be inside my kingdom, so that you could be a part of my heart for free, not because you deserve it. You could never do anything to deserve it. When you sin and you try to do stuff to make up for it, you could never make up for it. That's why he had to die. And so in verse 3, Paul says to the Galatians, are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, after coming to Jesus through faith, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? You see, these people who started believing the Judaizers, they had experienced persecution to become Christian. And Paul was saying, it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing if you go back to the old chains of being tied to the law. The rest of Galatians talks about the law. It says that the law is not evil. God is not against the law. What the law is, it's a temporary guardian until Jesus comes. Imagine it this way. Imagine that there's a raging tiger and it cannot be controlled and it's gonna hurt people and so you restrain it. You keep it behind the bars of a cage. The law is that cage. It doesn't have the power to change the raging tiger in our hearts. All it can do is restrain. But Galatians says when Christ comes, 
then the guardian is no longer necessary. Because you see, when Christ comes and we give our hearts to him, he has the ability to help us to die to the old stuff. And it's not easy. It doesn't feel good. Dying never feels good. But he can help us die to the old nature, to the raging tiger. And once that tiger has been tamed, it doesn't need a cage anymore. It doesn't mean it's going to be a raging tiger outside of a cage hurting people, which sometimes in Christianity we teach. We say it's okay, you don't need the law. You can just do whatever you want. But James says that faith without works is dead. Paul says that faith without love is nothing. So this tiger, scripture teaches, Jesus can tame that in our hearts. And so once you have a tame tiger, why would you send it back behind bars? That's what the Galatians were doing. They were going behind bars, even though they had Jesus. And I want to suggest that's sometimes what we do. We go back to the law. We go back to practices to evaluate whether or not we believe in God. And so here's the question. If you need effort, you need effort. What Dallas Willard says is that grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. If by your works, you cannot merit your salvation or merit your relationship with God, then what's the point of effort? I would say that as humans, we have experience and we can understand this. Um, back when my husband and I were dating, if you've met Pastor Wally here, he's my husband. Back when we were dating, uh, there was a summer where I was gonna go work at summer camp for three months and we had no cell service up there and he was gonna go to Guatemala for a mission trip. So we weren't gonna see each other for quite a while. And the night before I was supposed to go up to camp, he decided he was gonna come and see me, of course, so we can say goodbye. But that day his car broke down. And he lives in Riverside, which is about 40 minutes by car, but about two and a half hours by bicycle. That day it was 98, and 98 degrees, and it actually hit 105 within those two hours. But he got on his bicycle, and he biked all the way from Riverside to Loma Linda. And it was the craziest thing. I remember walking outside and seeing him laying down on the grass, like so hot. He's like, I didn't want to come in when I was sweaty. <laughs> but it's a crazy thing. Why would you do that? For love. Because love compels you internally to do crazy actions. And that's what God invites us to as well. He says, give me the raging tiger in your heart. And in your heart, I will compel you. You will desire to spend time with me. You will want to do the things that give me honor, not because you're afraid, not because someone told you once that you had to, but because you love me. And that's what Paul is trying to invite the Galatians to as well. He says in verse 26, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. We're children of God. And that's significant because children don't do anything. They don't do anything to earn their identity or their place in the family. In fact, as a child of my parents, I can say that children are a humongous headache and we cost tons of money and you know, we're a big pain in the butt. But God says, not because of anything you've done, but because of your status, because I've chosen you, and because you've chosen me back, you're my child. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the promise he made Abraham. He said, I'm gonna give you land, I'm gonna give you descendants, and I'm gonna give you blessing. And New Testament writers like Paul understood Old Testament writers, especially in the prophetic writings, for those writings to have a triple fulfillment. One for Abraham, one for us right now, intermediary in between, and one in the future. God clearly fulfilled his promise to Abraham, but now as heirs, as sons of Father Abraham, sons and daughters, we also get to inherit, and this is the inheritance we have. We get land too. God said he will give us this earth. He's given us the kingdom. We will have the, the gift of being descendants, belonging to God, and all the rights and the privileges of what it means to be a child of God. Not some beggar outside hoping he notices us, but someone inside the house, at the table, part of the family. And he gives us the blessings and the grace of forgiveness. It's an amazing gift that God gives. In Jewish prayer books, and even in many today, there's a saying that says, I thank God that you have not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And that's what Paul is addressing here. 
not Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. What he's saying is that none of us were able to make it. All of us failed. And so if we all failed and we're all standing in front of God by grace, why would we mess around with human distinctions? Why would we mess around with saying, because of gender or because of wealth or because of status or because of where I'm from, I'm better than you. In front of the cross, Paul is teaching, we are all equal, all equally in need of God's salvation. I read a story recently about a young boy who created a boat. And that boat was something so special to him. He took it out, and the first time he sailed it, it floated away. And he spent forever looking for that boat until one day in downtown, he found himself in front of a shop. And there was the boat in the shop window. And he went inside and he told the shop owner, this is my boat, give it to me. And the shop owner said, nope, I bought it from someone. If you want it, you're gonna have to buy it. And so he spent that entire summer mowing lawns for a dollar a lawn. And finally, when that summer was over, he took every penny he had, he put it on the counter, and he said, I want my boat. And the shopkeeper heard him as he was walking out, whispering to the boat, you're mine. You're twice mine. First I made you, and then I bought you. And that's what Christ has to say to us today. You're mine. You're twice mine. You don't have to worry about these human distinctions. Keep me at your center. I made you. I bought you. I want you to be mine. And so whether it's the first or the 1,000th time you've heard this, I want to invite you today to give your heart to Jesus, not to just decide to give money or decide to do these things, but to truly give your heart over to him in faith that he can take the raging lion and tame it and draw you to his kingdom. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. We could never understand it. We don't. So, Father, I pray that your spirit would shine your light in our hearts to help us to see and to understand the depth of your love for us. Forgive us, Father, for the times that we've tried to add to your word. And we pray that we would know who we are in you by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.